audience. I can see that they're saying the screen is black, but that's the way it's supposed to be, everybody. So no worries. Let's go yeah, ahead and... You know, that's that's the way it usually looks when you enter a cemetery at night and you start looking around for uh, something interesting. And so I was, um, yeah, anyway, so uh, I bounced around a number of ideas. I'm going to show you some uh, images that I thought what I would use initially from for a background. So now can you see an image? Should be yeah. this real creepy English cemetery. This is Norwood Cemetery uh, in England, and it looks like this. It's down in their catacombs, and I thought, man, this would be a perfect background for a Halloween kind of image because I can't think of anything more creepy. And then that turned out to be the problem. I couldn't think anything more creepy, so I kind of quickly ended thinking about uh, doing this. But uh, these old coffins, just as a point of interest, um, all the wooden stuff on them, of course, they're getting so old that uh, they're crumbling and decaying. But this was during the time of uh, a lot of really serious illness. So you can kind of see here and there on them, there are, uh, they're all lead lined. So even though the wood falls apart, they're all lead lined. So anyway, I shelved that idea and I came back to this idea. And initially, I started with about three, three or four different ghost images because Halloween, I thought I'd like to do a ghost. So um, plus, you know, Halloween's a great time because I don't have to explain to anybody why I draw the things I do. Um, it's October. So I started with this one. He's a little creepy. Then I went with this one and thought, well, maybe I'll go with him. And then eventually I went with this one, which is, um, if there are artists in the audience there, that want, this is a life-size wooden posable art mannequin that you can see the little ones of all the time that I owned at one time. And I threw a sheet over the top of it. It was in a figure drawing class and the class had to draw it. And I drew it too, but I just made it into a ghost. So. What I'm going to do is show you sequentially kind of how the image progressed and then I will go into painter and show you some of the things I did. So this will be pretty quick. Um, started with drawing. Uh, this, this is all done in painter. I started drawing the uh, ghost character. I put him on a layer. I repainted over all of the pencil and um, added a layer mask on it so I could fade him out. Then I had this tree and I thought, oh, that'd be great for a background. And then I decided not so much, but I changed the ghost to what I thought would be a nice ghostly look against the dark background, moved the tree over. So I'm still kind of exploring. That's kind of the ghost in on a new layer, seeing if I want to do something else with them. So I went back, applied another layer mask, moved him around a little bit and I started thinking, okay, I think this is gonna work, which is a nice thing to have happen instead of like trashing it and going back to square one. So I played with the concept just a little bit with the tree in it, decided I didn't like it. So started working with from reference to get some headstones. And then I would add, I would do painting along a path and I would do or align my strokes to a path for the little bevels and I had these little I would draw these little things by hand and I'll show you how to put them in selections and I used them then I started overlaying some textures to see if I could get anything neat happening and so these are just multiple layers and if I can't notice what I'm doing it's probably there's just a subtle texture change thought I put another little skull in it saw how the ghost would go over it and this got to be kind of the trickier part when, in just the initial start because I did want the ghost to be transparent enough that you could see through it, but I didn't want the background, the things behind the ghost to break up its shape. And so uh, I, I went back and forth a lot trying different things to get what I wanted to have happen. So here's another one I painted using the same reference and I thought I would add some, let's see, these are not big enough, but I started adding, 
you know, epitaphs on here. So he caught a fishbone in his throat, which made him sing an angel's note. That, you know, how clever is that? Not my clever though. So I positioned that one down a little bit lower and put it on this side. And then I added an epitaph to this guy, which was, I can't remember because I just pulled them off the web. First a cough carried me off, then a coffin they carried me off in. So if you just go online, find Halloween epitaphs, you can find all those kind of things. Started using the growth feature in Painter to add these tree shapes. If you haven't used growth or seen what it is, I'll show you where it is. It's it's a great, uh, great thing to use. And then I started adding layers because again, I, I'm trying to play with getting some fog in. I want to get this looking ghostly. I was going to add a little skeleton dog and put you know something and Fido or something on that but I decided I didn't like that so then I went and made an image hose from a bunch of vector tombstones and I used bevel world which is one of the layer plugins that I could add bevels to all these and painted a back row and then added some a layer mask to fade them out made them a little darker and here you can see me experimenting with I wanted to add one more row but I wasn't sure on the size I wanted to use so I just sprayed out two groups I decided this was the right size started to fade it out position it cut some of that out got rid of that one then I'm looking back at my ghost and I've lost a little color in him but he's is showing transparently well enough and so I'm getting the tombstones positioned putting some more fog in, lightening a little bit, the tombstones, uh, the front ones. And I've got just about the right amount of transparency, I think, at this point. So repainting, retouching them just a little bit, brightening the ghost a little bit, dulling the ghost down a little bit. Uh, you know, I've got to try different things. I never seem to hit it on the first try. I wanted the ghost tipped a little more, so it looked like it was maybe moving. Thought, well, you know, I need a moon, so put in a moon behind the tree layer. Tried to make it glow, that didn't work. So went back to square one, tried to make it glow, that didn't work, that didn't work. So that didn't work until I changed um, the composite method and moved it around a little bit and added some different color and I think I like that pretty well brightened it up darkened the trees a little bit against it and my ghost I wanted him where you can see these tree holes left by the trees I painted them out behind the ghost because I didn't want any of this kind of thing doing this and breaking up the image of the important part of the ghost which would be its face so I can't remember what I did in there, but something. A um, little more work on the ghost. That back one, you can see a little bit, whoops, the tree holes I was painting out. See these kind of things I wanted to get rid of. Then I'm getting pretty close to done at this point. And I wanted to add in ectoplasm or, or whatever it would be to give the ghost a little movement so it just didn't look like it was statically standing uh, standing there and these are uh, done with particle brushes uh, specifically I, I was using uh, smoke and steam brushes and then this is just these little spots are just a drippy pen brush that's one of the standard brushes and uh, done on a layer and then these were all set to a screen and then let me see i can't remember what's happening here or there so i guess i'm pretty much done i'm not going any farther oh smoke between the headstones that's what i was doing couldn't even see it happening and then a little grass just in the very front and that's pretty much oh and i did use particle brush around around the moon too so that's pretty much how I came up with the whole image. And I, I just, I save in constantly. And so there's about 60 different saved 
versions of this image. And this is the final one. And I didn't really have quite, um, quite what I was gonna show. I didn't say this is a JPEG I should have because my very last step is usually I you can't even see it, it's transparent enough. I'll put on a pattern, an overlay, and what it helps do is it changes a little bit some of the coloring and things a little more randomly. And so you can see as I click it on and off, there, there are these slight changes going on. And this specifically, I really like, uh, I really like to use crackle patterns. So um, I'll turn it on and off and, and I go ahead and leave. So you can see on the tombstone, some crackle coming in. Um, I really like to the subtle color changes that it gives to an image. And then you can see on the sky, actually, I left quite a bit of the crackle coming through. And so this is 100%. It's a pretty big image. It's, let me see, I think it's 4,000 by, you know, it's 4340 by 2,000. So um, that's not huge, but it's, it's a big enough image that, uh, you know, I could get in and work on it. Most of the time when I'm painting, I don't work at more than 200% um, because I find that anything above that, I will start to hit the point of diminishing returns where I may not be able to see the details I'm putting in at print. I can see them as screen, but it, if I'm doing it for print, I don't wanna do a whole lot of extra work uh, that's not gonna be visible. And if any of in an example of that, as any of you who are familiar with what I did for Painter 2015, the, the princess image, in the printed version, you cannot see the freckles on her nose. But if I show that, whoops, sorry about that, wrong program. But if I show uh, the full version at, on the screen, you can see it. So this is, at this point, the end process. Um, what I do for essentially each project is, I, and I just call this my junk drawer, but I create these custom pa palettes. And so in this case, I've got the most used brushes and materials, and most of these don't change. All of these kind of up in here are uh, either default brushes that I like, or more often than not, they're brushes that I've created. And I kind of keep them all in one spot. And I don't use thumbnails really because it's easier for me to uh, to know what the brush is if I just read the text very quick. This is some brushes that I will use. So this is the, it's called Tombstone, but it's really just an image hose brush, but it's got the settings I use to paint the tombstone. I took a default brush and changed it. And then these are some particle brushes that just do different things. I will also drag off paper textures and some are default and a lot of them are mine and patterns so that I can put it nice down in a corner and I can click back through it instead of having to drill down through the brushes. And, and I've got way too many brushes loaded, but, uh, I eventually, it's funny, got hundreds and hundreds of brushes and I eventually use like, you know, 20 of the most important ones to me all the time. Uh, but I like to have them all loaded. And then I have on here a second custom palette. And if you don't know how to make a custom palette, it's really easy if you're using a brush, if you just hold the shift key down and you can drag the icon off and let up and it's got a new custom palette and you can come in and do different things. You can set the view or not. And then if you come under window, custom palette, you can see I've got four here. If I click on organizer, I can select that and I can rename it. So whatever makes sense. Um, and now you can see it's kind of spelled like I missed a key. So that's probably what I did. 
So I'll save these and I'll add different brushes to them. And then I will create another custom palette for these, the commands, the most used commands, because sometimes I have to go down uh, into a sub palette to find something or uh, just two or three levels down. And if I can add that into a custom palette, it's a lot quicker. So you see there are a lot of basically rulers, uh, layer content, duplicate, a lot of layer commands here. Uh, saving and loading selections, showing guides. Um, mostly it's, a, excuse me, it's a lot of layer commands. I'll put mirror mode on one because I like to use these. Um, Bevel World, which is one of the plugins down here. But to do that, you start up here with, uh, you go to window again and custom palette and organizer and I'll just add it to this one. And let's see, that's the wrong way. Went there, I went down too quick, I think. Window, custom palette, add command. So it comes up and half the time I'll forget to select the palette I wanna use. And then you pick a menu item. So let's see, I'll just pick anything. I'm going to pick, since I will use it, Esoterica and Growth. Then I'll click Add. I added it here, and that's okay. It's on that on that webinar one. And so then my commands will all be in here, and then I combine them both into uh, Palette Drawer, and I'll do that here. And then I can just click through them instead of having to line them up. I have a selection palette drawer also because the individual ones on here I can't drag off into any of these. So I just added the whole selection portfolio window here. And you can see that's so I could access all these little hand done things that I did use for my tombstones, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of my general work setup. And then I will save that just along the bottom edge somewhere and I will go through it as I'm painting or, or whatever I'm doing. My hardest thing on this image was simply the number of layers I had to work through to get exactly what I wanted happening uh, in layers, like going back into the atmosphere. So it was, I, I got up to about 40, 45 layers, which is a lot more than I usually use. I don't, as a general rule, do any of the uh, the particle brushes or this kind of texturing thing that you see until uh, the very end of the process. Because if I do, I'm gonna end up changing it anyway because I'm still working through the color and the composition, uh, trying to get the right depth. I originally had a little second ghost in the background here and then I looked at it and thought, oh, that's really stupid. So I took him out. Um, so this is pretty much what I've come up with. Uh, what I do use is I'll show you growth, which is kind of neat. It's one of those overlooked, let me just minimize this out of the way. One of those overlooked things that um, if, is really quite useful actually but it can be a little tricky to use. So, and it is, I almost always maximize my window and I love that I can move it around. So I'll click on growth, brings up this dialog box and it says drag in the document to grow the pattern, which is, is true. If I wanna do trees though, I only do one branch and then, it, you, then you can just move all this stuff around and get whatever kind of look you want. If you uncheck it, you can get some really interesting, much more organized or chaotic one way or the other kind of things. When you get something you like, and you can just do it. It's one of those things, if you're not a little bit careful, you can kind of play a little bit too much. 
like there used to be an automatic brush creator years ago and I'd sit down to create a brush I wanted and end up playing just creating new brushes. So when you've got it, what you try to do is pick the general center of the window and drag your circle. I have not yet figured out how to contain it real well to make it line up the way I want to do it. So I will usually just do it um, and, and I'll rearrange it. So I'll copy this, put it on a new layer. I'll put on a new layer. It does not work on a transparent layer, but I'll put on a new layer, which I actually do have here so I can click on it. And I will use keyboard commands too a lot of the time, but it does need to be filled with a color. Otherwise it won't, uh, you won't see the effect. Now, I don't know why I'm not seeing my preview, but that's live television. Oh, it's because it wants to draw me a white, a white tree, which wouldn't do me a lot of good. So I'm not gonna go through this too much, but um, it works really pretty well. You can make really cool tubmal weeds. So I'll start in the middle, drag, and you know, get close to the edge and let up. And then what I'll do is I'll come through and select them. And I make sure contiguous is not checked because I wanna select all the white everywhere. I can select the black too, but for some reason I select background usually and uh, invert the selection and backspace to get rid of the white. Oh, got rid of everything. Sorry, wrong move there. So I'll do it, undo it a couple times. That's why I invert the selection. Um, backspace to get rid of the background. Do it on the next one, the same thing. And then I will have it just, I will have this whole layer here. What I usually do is fill the background layer with a color that I know is going to be kind of what I'm using because see, I'm gonna to wanna to get rid of all of this kind of thing. And uh, I found one way that works really well to do it, and I won't waste your time showing it right now, but if you come in and pick burn and set it to the opacity is really high, um, your saturation is really high, you can come in and actually darken some of these. Well, I gotta be on the right layer. Sorry about that. So you can darken them and you can start to get rid of the white halos. And this one would work really well. Cause see, there's still a little bit of white halo on it. And I don't wanna be dealing with those in the engine, in the image. So I'll just take a little bit of time and get rid of them here using, uh, using the burn tool. And I'll actually usually make it really big so I can be really quick. I tell my students when I'm teaching them to be a lazy artist, and what I'm really meaning is use what you've got to be a fast artist and do the best you can. So um, that's how I made the trees. And then I'll just distort them. So for example, to make a little more tree-like, I don't know why it did that, but well, no, it's picking up some black and white on the side. Interesting. Uh, but basically, bring it in and while it's in this distort mode, I'll just start pulling it. Now I, of course, have to go back in and, sorry, I would have to go back in and get rid of the white that's surrounding it. but I'll make tree shapes by tweaking them around. And another thing that I use to distort stuff, which I don't think is what it is meant to be used for. And so I'll just do it on here. Even Let me get rid of what, what I can see. 
because this is this really is a valuable tool. Okay, so I've got this little guy now. Move him into here. Oh my goodness sakes. Get rid of that real quick. I wonder if it's go to webinar that's causing the problem. I don't know, because you know I'm not even being able to select anything right now. So well, let me show you what I do when I'm not when I'm not fighting it. Because I found a brush that's in the FX section. This is a default brush, and it's this Distorto brush. Let me make sure I've got the def default set. If you change a brush in any way in here, you will need to, and you save it as a variant, then you're going to, you're going to need to restore the original default variant. So I'm just checking it and see how it changed quite a bit. Now I'm going to tweak it, but what I'll do is I'll make it big and the strength I will move down a lot. Because if I leave it up here, see it really can get a little too strong and a little too messy. But if I take the strength down a lot, I can start to move the brush without losing a lot of the detail. So I can actually reshape things. And, and the lower the strength, the better you can reshape, but it takes a little more work. So instead of just distorting it, I can make specific tree shapes, that kind of thing. Softens a little bit, but generally what I'm doing, if it's on a pencil sketch or something, it doesn't make too much difference for me. So go ahead and close that. Another thing I used in the image, in this image a lot was um, selection, selections. Okay, I've got them out already. It's probably, selection portfolio. I haven't used this a lot uh, before, but it's really kind of nice because you can, and I'll go ahead and add it on to here, double click whatever one you want, and it should add it. Okay, there's the selection. And you can, of course, then modify that, move it around. Well, I cut it out, I wasn't supposed to do that. Let's make a new layer. Sorry, how come it always goes so easy when I'm sitting here quietly listening to Spotify? Um, maybe I've got to have it, do have to have it filled. Oh, okay. And it just went away. So anyway, then you can fill it, resize it, move it. <laughs> and I'm having a terrible time working with it. But this is how I made uh, the bones and things. And you can you can make your own. It comes with a default palette. But I made my own. And I'm not quite sure why it isn't just filling this individual piece. Well, there it worked. And then it becomes something you can you know move around, position. And to make the shadowy kind of look is really easy. And I will reload the selection, just control and click on the thumbnail. And I'll create a new layer. And I'm gonna fill the new layer with a, a really bright color. So I, you can use a gradient if you want. I'm just doing it with a regular fill right now. And then I've rearranged them a little bit. Let me fill this one with a black so it's a little more dramatic. Make sure you do the right layer, Don, not the wrong one. I may have not filled his eyes in. Oh, geez, good grief. That's why I zoom in so I can get <laughs> actually fill what I want to work. 
and I better check this character. Okay, he's okay. And then just to give it a little bevel, select the bottom layer and usually I keyboard it. So I use the arrow keys to move it down and around a little bit. And this is a little more dramatic than what I've done with the fish or any of these. And I'll group them and I will collapse them together. And often I'll soften them because the selections can leave a little rougher edge than I like. So I'll soften it. Whoops, not sharpen it. I need to move soften onto my mo or focus onto my most used, soften onto my most used palette. And then that's how to get a good, a good um, kind of embossed look or carved look. I will do the same thing with all these letters were done the same way. I type the letters in first in dark, then I would convert it to a raster layer, duplicate the layer, and I will either click the preserve transparency or I will load a selection by clicking on the small icon and that has nothing to do with these, but that's how I do it. And then paint the lighter one and then just offset them a little bit. And here I actually lowered the transparency some on these so I could have some cracks and things show through them a little bit. Not much, but, but just a little bit. This one's a little more opaque and this one's a little harder to read. The particle brushes, they were really fun to use on this. If you haven't used uh, particle brushes, you should use them. Um, I, in this case, used these. Let's see. I know where it is. It's smoke and what did I call it? I can't remember even what I called it. And I should remember it since I made it, right? Smoke and steam. And so it comes up with all these brushes. Let me go ahead and minimize this one, create a new one so you can see it a little better. But because I don't remember a lot of what uh, the brush will actually do, and I'm painting this with a mouse. So there's not a ton of control using a mouse. But this, this is how I made all of the, you know, the foggy kind of effects because I will make them on a new layer usually. And then I will, when I've made something that I like, I'll duplicate the layer because I like to soften the underlying one a little bit. So soften, I really like that the last effect you use is brought up and you can change the settings for it. So I'm softening the background one and you can go real, real soft, but I won't. And then this one, I'll lower the opacity a little bit so I can get really, really nice smoky effects. And each one does a little bit different. I'll combine these. Sometimes, a lot, oftentimes I'll group things, group layers until I make sure that I have them just the way I like them. And then when I get them, I'll collapse them. I used, instead of the default method, an awful lot, the screen method. It doesn't change much on here, but it usually will lighten and uh, intensify some of the color you're using. Hey, John. Some, uh, yes. Um, so the brush that you're using right now, is, yes. that is, those are custom brushes that you made, right? These, I actually did make this brush pack, um, but these are, uh, these are, not, these are from the brush pack, the installer that you guys have. Um, so 
I might have tweaked them a little bit to actually draw with them, but really not so much because uh, once I went through them to see what they would do, I didn't need to, but they, you know, they're, they're not my custom brushes. They're in the, the brush packs. So um, I think that's what you're asking me. Just to let everybody know, um, we have additional brush packs and you can see those in the welcome screen. And this one that he's playing around with right now is called Smoke and Steam. And it's the best of all of them, except the other ones I made. <laughs> so, <laughs> shameless self-promotion, you know. Um, I, I like this because there's some just kind of like really strange little ones. Uh, but it, it was made specifically to be able to make, uh, you know, smoky, steamy um, chimney smoke. So it comes out of the chimney thin, and then as it goes off, it bleeds out. And again, if you do soften these, you can get some really, uh, I think, you know, smoky looking kind of effects very, very, very easily. So um, a couple of my favorites in here, of course, I... If I had painted the crypt interior, I would have used this cobwebs brush to add some cobwebs here and there. But let me see, I've seen it. Curtain, I'm looking, which one is it? I like this brush a lot. This is the one I kind of used to make some of the ectoplasm coming off the the ghost um, and I like this one a lot and I don't know why I like a little brush that spins but you know it's actually I find it really useful it doesn't you know it spins while you draw with it but I like it if I sit here and just go in a circle and I can get these really random kind of spins there are and you can see here um, starting from about here down these are all i've got some of my own stuff i've built below but down to about here and i don't have all the brush packs some of these are ones i made earlier that are my own but uh, all of these are brush packs that you can get and they all do different things and they're they're great um I, again, use them mostly, mostly for um, as I'm getting toward the final stages of, of something. That's supposed to, it's blending with the underlying layer, but it's supposed to look like a dandelion. I know that because I think I made this brush too. Anyway, I use a lot of those to get, um, let me close this, to get these, these kind of, you know, swirling looking things. I also used them to get the fog. You can kind of see the basic shapes in them. And the, the that spinning brush I showed you, I used it to kind of, I don't know, may, maybe the moon's going nuclear or something, but uh, I, I like to break up large areas of uh, flat color or gradients. I think it just makes the uh, whole area a lot more interesting to look at. This particular brush was, uh, it was really, it's just a very, very simple brush. And I haven't changed it back to uh, its original one. So I'll just show you what it is. Pens and pencils, leaky pen, and I'll create a new layer to show you just what I did. That's pretty much what I did. And I did it with, obviously, um, a more ghostly kind of color. And I, I tap it a lot, you know, sometimes I'll draw a little stroke, but I'll tap a lot when I'm using these kinds of brushes to really be in control. The same thing with uh, image hoses. So I get it to that point, I turn it into a screen layer and it gets a lot lighter I lower the transparency some so it looks a little bit more like it's glowing and soften it. So really, really easy. I 
we'll do this in conjunction with some like the splattery airbrush uh, to make a lot of these. I was going to add like ghost orbs, you know, the ones everybody says they can record in haunted houses. I thought, oh, I'll make some ghost orbs. And I thought, no, that's as stupid as a second ghost. So I eventually didn't do it. If you duplicate the layer, it will actually brighten up continually. And so I'll often start at some point and then continue to duplicate it. That's how I make the glow around a sphere. I will um, create uh, a, a circular selection. So also when you're, if you hold shift, it's not, there it goes, it's, it'll make perfect circle. And if you hold alt, it will go from the middle point that you start, start at. So I'm making a moon on a new layer and I fill it with a little bit darker color to begin with, but pretty full, pretty high saturation. Fill that, and I'll deselect it, turn it to screen, and uh, lower the saturation and soften it a lot. So it starts to fade into the background. And I'll duplicate it, but now I will holding the shift, I'll start to do create a whole shift and alt and I'll scale it down so you can see I'm getting a little bit smaller one in there. I'll duplicate that one and I'll do this, I, I don't know, anywhere from three uh, to five times and I may, I may uh, select them and actually change the colors of them as I do it. I do also, just, just so you know, um, often when I do something like this, I'll get emails from people saying, um, did you know there's shortcut keys for that? And yeah, I, I do, but I try not to use too many of them when I'm showing something alive. Otherwise you won't know uh, what I'm doing. So that should have not, saved that harshly, but that's okay. I'll go ahead and soften it again. And when you've got that all done, select them all and collapse the layers and it will change them back to default. So I'll just change it back to screen again. And so then see, I could start making a, a hanging lantern or something in a, a tree and it bleeds nicely if you align it over, you can see it actually changes the colors of what is under it, which in the case of trees could be really nice if I'd actually made these trees up here that the light's spilling around glow a little bit. So I guess I'll do that. So now my moon actually is the light spilling around that and making it glow. And let me see what else. Oh, nozzles. I make my own nozzles. So let me show you the ones I made for um, the tombstones. Nozzles are, I think, one of my favorite things because they make painting anything like the grass. You can see all of this stuff so much easier. So here's my tombstone nozzles. What you do is you put each element on an individual layer and then you group that layer and then there's a command up here to make the nozzle from the group and it'll put them into a grid on a new file and then to use it you save it and I always put whatever the name of it is so this is like tombstone and then I add the word nozzle and then a number to it. Otherwise, and you must save in a RIF format. Otherwise you can get so many files with the same name that you, you don't know what, you know, what um, 
which one's a nozzle and which one isn't. I put it on the wrong layer. Let me create a new layer. Now what's happening here is I've got it setting using the additional color, which is the secondary color. If I want it to just put out what the, this nozzle now looks like, what it originally looked like, but I can gradually fade it by adding additional color to it. And I can gradually scale it down uh, to really fake in perspective a lot. When I demo this initially, I will actually use this layer that comes default with it. And I'll do this little fake, look, we're gonna paint San Francisco and I'll select a nice little background layer that is kind of sky colored. And now with the additional color, looks like that. And then I'll gradually increase. And as I come forward, I will make the nozzle bigger and bigger, which I'm not bothering to do right now. And then it all of a sudden starts looking like San Francisco. And then I'll, put some, you know, with perspective, and then I'll put some birds on it. And this swallow nozzle is also the same. It's a default one. And I, I, I will play with them and increase and tweak the spacing, do that kind of thing. So learn to make nozzles, uh, use the image hose, customize the brushes. Those are really fantastic tools to use if you've got to paint a lot of something. Um, if you only have to paint one or two things. Oh, however, I should say this. Um, here is a nozzle that is um, just one. There's only, there's only one in it. So I made a group of one. And let me get to the brush that works with this one. Because this is really cool. Say you want to paint tentacles. This really works great. Um, if I can find my image hoses. Okay, well, okay, purple worm, that'll work. I'm gonna change, okay, that's fine. But you could also paint nozzles, I mean paint tentacles. And that's just from one, you know, circular selection filled with a gradient from a light, a circular gradient. And if you go up, you're seeing the underside of it. If you come down, you're seeing the top. The other thing I was telling you I used a lot was constraining these to a shape to get these areas. So what you do to do that, get your pen tool and you create a vector shape of whatever you want. It can be closed or open, doesn't matter. Then I'll select my brush. I'll come up, up under here for stroke options and I'll align that to the path. And while you can't see the path a lot, all of a sudden I can't draw anywhere else. There's nothing going on. But as soon as I get onto the path, I can align it to the path. And if I vary a little too much with this brush, it'll break off. And it's something about the image hose and the, how closely it uh, does what it does that it, if I just vary a little bit, it goes off. A regular brush doesn't go off quite as much, but um, so for example, my brush. And what it does too is every time you paint it constrained to the shape, it creates a new layer. So you can paint, um, really complicated things. I knew a medical illustrator and he would paint blood vessels with it. So with it constrained to the shape and with a bigger shape, and this will be real quick. I can't see the shape, so I can't tell when I'm actually on it. So he would start out doing his first portion of his blood vessel. 
and then he would come in and select the shape again and he'd move the color up a little bit and make the brush a little smaller and because he selected the shape again it constrains to the same path this works with every brush to except i have to say i haven't tried it with a lot of particle brushes because that kind of defeats the purpose of having random particles. Um, and he'd select it again, and he'd make it a little more. I use this a lot if I'm painting jewelry, because it's very easy to add a highlight to something. And I don't do a lot of medical illustration, like never. So I don't need to paint blood vessels. But then when you get them all painted, you don't have to leave them where they are, you can tweak them and move them around. But, you know, this is kind of what I use then to make the bevels and things here. As long as your shape is on here, you might have the problem that you come back on and you go, I can't paint anymore. Make sure you double check that that's not selected, otherwise, it's like having a hidden selection, which sometimes happens too. So on, on, for example, on this layer, you can show the marching ants, but you can also under the selection, if you don't wanna see them, see them, you can hide them somewhat, hide marquee. Okay, so you'll be painting along, everything's good, and all of a sudden you can't do anything because the, this is still selected you just can't tell that it's selected because you can't see those marching ants. The other one that I always sticks, uh, gets me a little bit. So let me just, I'll just control D it and now I can paint anywhere. But the other one that always gets me is I'll be working along and I will, to clean up something, I will preserve transparency and I'll forget that I've got it turned on and I start painting and then I start cursing and then I start and then eventually, oh yeah, yeah, go in and uncheck the preserve transparency. Um, I've used this program since the first version and I still make those kind of mistakes. I like this out because then I can you know, pick my last uh, used brushes, which is really nice. So I'll do that. I'll show you a couple others. So here's, they're not spaced very well because they're not meant to be, but th these are flies actually, because who doesn't need flies sometimes? I think this is tumbleweeds, except that I'm showing, oh, it's the background color. I should remember that. So that's, then this is growth. So there are a lot of, um, I've, I've used it for gunshots, uh, grass, oh, the little grass you can see down here. That's, well, here's, these are thorn ones. It's hard to see, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so there's thorns. Those are blades of grass, though. I know that you can't tell. So anything, these are kind of weeds. Anything where I need to paint a lot real quick, leaves, clouds, um, I will actually spend the time building image hoses to do that. Um, at one point, I know we're about over. At one point, I had a publisher ask me to do some characters on a pile of 10,000 gun shells. And so I actually took the time to make a gun shell and rendered it in 3D in a, with a locked camera and a locked light. And I just spun it around in like three different positions and had about 90 elements to the gun shell. But boy, it sure made it painting easier. And they were so impressed. It's like, wow, how'd you do that? And it's like, oh, you know, I just brushed my head and like I was sweating a bunch and said, it was so much work. Uh, so I, you know, I never tell them the secret to painting all of those things. They wouldn't understand it anyway. So um, I guess if there's any questions, I 
I'm kind of, those are the things I use. This is what I did. Um, I built it up mostly not taking my own best advice and deciding early in planning. I had to go through a couple of iterations to get to what I wanted to do. And uh, I'm actually really happy with it. Usually when I look at something I've got done, I wake up and or I go to bed at night and I was telling Tanya that, you know, I go to bed tonight at night and I look at something and go, yeah, you're pretty damn good, you know? You're all right. And then I come back in in the morning, look at it and go, you've got to be kidding. And I've got to do a webinar today and explain what I'm doing. Um, I'm never, ever satisfied. I could continue working this like crazy. But at a certain point, you got to say, done's done. I actually cropped out just this part today and stuck it on Instagram with a link to the webinar if anybody wanted to, you know, come. And, uh, uh, you know, now it's time to move on. I've got a couple more ghost ideas that I want to do. And um, I don't paint a lot of Christmas stuff, but, uh, you know, maybe I'll paint a Christmas card or something this year, but. Uh, I think you uh, should, Don. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody that's listened to me drone on, thank you. I, you know, I've enjoyed talking and it's a little strange because I can only hear Tanya. And so sometimes if I'm not paying too much attention, it's like, is anybody out there? And uh, no, everybody it, is still here, and I've been trying to field some of the questions as we've been going along, and what it's made me realize is that, um, number one, I don't think we have a really good tutorial on how to make nozzles. Okay. So maybe, if you have time, um, that'd be sure. a good one to do, and I just think, in general, you showed so many things, some of which I didn't even know existed. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, just general questions about how to make brushes. If I had a drawing that I wanted to turn into a brush, so maybe that's something we could work on together, John. I, yeah, I'm happy to, you know, I, I specifically tried to, in, in this one, concentrate on using things that people might not be as familiar with because, you know, I'm still finding things like, oh, isn't that amazing? And so I can even show amazing right now, uh, real quick. It'll take me just a second. And uh, it's one of those features. It's like, I don't know why it's there, but uh, believe it or not, I've actually used it. So if anybody out there ever gets bored, there's nothing better than coming in and making a maze, except that one's way too small. So if you put in maybe 10, Oh, I'm sorry, thickness, I need to put in 10. And update it, then you can make a maze. That one's probably too hard for me to even do, but uh, change the seed. And if it's just too boring, you know, have it display the solution for you. Uh, but if you do want to make yourself crazy, put in one and uh, you won't even be able to see. Okay, so there's the maze. And isn't this amazing? You know, zoom in. I'll say okay, and zoom in. At what extent? You know, do you want to print this out and actually try to do it? Never. But it makes some really interesting background sometimes. So there's there's enough. Excuse me. There's another one of those features that. You know, why it's there, who knows, but, you know, when it's there, I don't know anything else that really does it. So I'm I'm glad it's there. And there's a lot of that. So, yeah, growth's, growth's another one. Not a lot of people use growth, and it's just as cool as can be. The particle brushes, you know, get you a few packs that uh, sound like uh, something you would like to use, you know, whether it's superhero or spaced out or I think there's fashion ones. Um, I've done a few nature kind of based ones. Um, they're just so useful. And, and again, usually I use them at the end when I'm putting uh, the final touches on. But, you know, you can draw with them. You can you can do whatever you want with them. Um, yeah, image hose is very, very under underused, in my opinion. Let me tell I you. I agree with you. But you have a good worse. handle on it. 
well it you know it makes painting a forest or tumbleweeds or you know all sorts of things fast and the the flexibility is there to make it layer beautifully um, randomly uh, and like I even showed you with a, a nozzle of one image you can paint tentacles or worms or you know it, it's just crazy powerful to use so um, thanks everybody mm -hmm.